Thank you, everyone, for coming. Uh, introduce myself. I'm Ryan Kamari from JFY Networks. I'm an instructional technology integration specialist. Um, thanks for coming to the it's JFY Nets students uh, success with JFY Nets success with our students. Um, today we're going to have three presenters um, utilizing three different parts of our program. Um, us as an organization. We come into schools, we help integrate technology. We take that technology and align it um, to the mass curriculum frameworks, to pacing guides within that school, um, to the student, uh, to the teacher's current curriculum. So it's kind of like a seamless process and they get to use all our tools with what they've traditionally taught. Um, last year, we worked uh, in over 40 middle school and high schools and served over 10,000 students. Um, we're not just a test prep program, which part of our program is, but we also are there as a support service to help teachers just get the technology into the classroom and just help them teach. Uh, the first part, the first presenter is going to speak about our program called JFY Net Plus. What this program is, is an expanded uh, curriculum that uses web-based tools as well as adaptive curriculum and we're going to be specific about a high school biology review course. The second program that we're going to talk about is called Target Deliver and what this is is a uh, prioritizing uh, math, math standards and then matching those standards up with the tools that we have and uh, continuing along the process of formative assessments. And then the final piece is called My Course, and we're gonna focus on specifically a fully digital middle school science course. And I'd like to bring up right now Shannon Donnelly from North Shore Tech. All right, well as Ryan said, I'm Shannon Donnelly, and I am a biology teacher at North Shore Technical High School in Middleton. Um, last year we started using um, JF YNET software for the grade 10 science review. We used it to prepare our students for the grade 10, I'm sorry, grade 10 science review. And we used it to prepare them for their grade 10 MCAS in biology. Um, so what I'll talk a little bit about today is a little bit about Moodle. We'll discuss how um, the Moodle site is aligned to the Massachusetts State Frameworks for Biology. And then I'm going to show you um, a few things that are included. So there are adaptive curriculum, online quizzes and tests, and web resources. Last, then I will show you a teacher guide, which is a new little component from JFY. And then talk a little bit about how we used the software in, um, in Middleton at North Shore Tech. All right. So, Moodle is an open source course management system. This is a little bit of computer lingo that I'm not entirely familiar with, that's okay. Um, if you're wondering why it's called Moodle, it's an acronym for uh, Modular Object Oriented Dynamic Learning Environment. Um, plus, it's fun to say. Um, and it's designed to support a social constructionist framework of education. There is more information about these ideas at the Moodle website, which is here. Um, so it's moodle.org. Note, there is no www. Everyone puts www first, so avoid that. Just go right for Moodle. All right. Um, so when the MCAS scores became available, or the MCAS test became available, the people at JFY look at the MCAS test, and they ranked each standard. So you can see here that the rankings are from 1 to 8. Um, one being the most commonly seen standard on MCAS, and that's standard 6.3, which is food chains and biological communities. And then 8 is sort of the one that's seen the least, which is 4.1, and that is the digestive system. So by ranking, they figure out how often topics tend to pop up on the test, and those topics provide a lot of questions that can be used for the quizzes and tests that are found um, throughout the program. It also targets those things that are tested so the kids aren't spending time reviewing information that doesn't tend to come up on the test. So one of the parts of the program ha is what we call adaptive curriculum. Adaptive curriculum are sort of these interactive little sites that the kids can go to and they love them. At least my students love them. Um, so there's several things they can do. Um, 
one that I like the best is the real world experiments. It actually looks like they're doing a lab, only they're doing it all through the computer. So I was playing around with one last night on photosynthesis and the kids can click, put a plant in a bowl with a fish and then they can adjust the light and it will track and graph all of the, um, the rate of photosynthesis, the rate of oxygen production. So it may provide them with tools that you don't have in a lab or you don't have enough money to buy all the equipment, but they can do it right online. Um, and it's sort of a better way to review than just talking to them. Um, there's also um, other things that are more like games. There's a game called um, Agent Organelles where the kids have a whole city full of agents and each agent is modeled after an organelle and if they know what the organelle does then they know what the agent does and they can put them into certain situations. Um, so it's sort of a fun way to get them re to review as opposed to just reviewing all the questions over and over. Um, a couple of things about the adaptive curriculum, they sometimes take a little bit of time to load, so remind the kids to take their time and be a little bit patient while they load. Um, and they vary, different adaptive curriculums do different things, so they're not going to be all the same, which is good. All right. So for tests and quizzes, there are at least one to two quizzes for each standard and there's one test for each standard. Um, the quizzes typically have about four multiple choice questions and the tests have ten. Um, let's see, the questions and answers will be randomized and the students can take them as many times as necessary in order to master the material, but they won't get the exact same questions and answers each time, um, which is good. The first time they did it, my students, they got it wrong, got a few wrong, so they wrote down all their answers, and then the questions jumbled, so it didn't help them. So they had to go back and look at the material and try to figure out what was the problem. Um, much of the questions come directly from MCAS tests, so they'll be familiar with these types of questions when they do go to take the test. Um, any standard where there was not enough questions to get, four for the quizzes and ten for the test, um, questions were pulled from other um, websites that had reliable questions. And there is a way for us to go back and track how often or how well the students do on each test or quiz. So last year I just assigned each one and the kids had to go and take it and I could see how they did. Hopefully they went back several times if they had trouble and took it as many times as they needed to till they got a hundred percent. Um, after a while, my students started to sort of compete with one another. Let's see how many times you have to take it to get 100 and see how many times I have to take it to get 100. So it kind of got their competitive nature going, which was good. All right. The next thing is web resources. So there are websites listed, or links I should say, listed under each standard. And um, the students can go and read through the website. Some websites actually have quizzes built into the site, so they can look at the website and take that quiz as well. Um, I found that I even use these websites in my day-to-day -day lessons. If I'm looking on, at a website to find a website on photosynthesis, instead of Googling photosynthesis and searching through all the websites, I log on to Moodle and I find the standard and I see what has already been checked and tested and I know it's a good site and that's what I use. So it can be helpful for the teacher as well as the student. Um, some are um, more sort of interactive, lots of pictures and things. Some are just kind of text that the kids have to read through, but it's helpful um, and it, it does help with the quizzes and tests because they can look up some of the information. Okay, the teacher guide is something new. In fact, I just got my teacher guide, but I think it's going to be very helpful. It has an overview of each activity, has time estimates about how long you need to allot for certain topics or standards. Um, and some suggestions, there are notes about maybe the students should take notes on this site or you know, maybe you need to preview the site, talk about this before the kids go to take the, the mastery test or view the site on their own. Um, this is going to be available as a PDF and it will be on the Moodle site. Right? All right, so this is how we used um, the review site. Um, we only used it for 10th grade and we used it this past year for MCAS review. Um, we pretty much got them rolling in the spring and we used it for the four weeks leading up to the June MCAS. We were able to have the kids use it every day for about four weeks. I found that short bursts of time are better than long blocks of time. So we have 88 minute classes in, at North Shore. 45 minutes was about as much as I could get until they kind of started wandering to other sites. So I think if you can allot about 45 minutes, I think that's a reasonable amount of time. Before we began, 
having the students use it. I went through the site with them using my smart board, but any computer with a projector would work. And I showed them how to log in. I showed them how to go to the standard that they needed and how to look what was available. We looked at an adaptive curriculum. We looked at a website. We looked at a quiz and a test. So that way, they had at least seen the information before they had to go work through it on their own. And it, it really helped them um, to kind of get to the computer and start it and just run with it. Also, I found that providing feedback to JFY was very helpful. Anytime we had any issues or suggestions, I would let Dave know, and more often than not, within a couple of weeks, things were going exactly the way we needed them to go. So I think that's unusual and very helpful. We also um, handed out instructions for the students every day. We didn't just put them in front of the computer and say, here you go, review for MCAS. We gave them specific sections that we wanted them to cover. We said, you're going to cover this standard, you're going to do these websites, you're going to look at this quiz and this test, so that they were sort of pointed in the right direction. Then they could spend as much time on that if they wanted to, as they needed to. If they got through it quickly and got 100 on the test, they could move on. But if they needed extra time, they could stay. Uh, earphones are helpful for um, the adaptive curriculum. By the end of the year, we, the kids were plugging in their iPod earphones so they could listen to the, um, to the instructions and the details in those adaptive curriculum lessons. And looking over the lessons prior to students is helpful, but the teacher guide may facilitate that as well. This is an example of our directions. This is what we did. Some of our um, time spent working with Moodle was when um, the students were pulled out of shop class, so I was not with them. So they needed a little bit more guidance about where to go. So we would give them these when they got to the computer lab. They'd know exactly where to go. So here's number seven, your standard four. Look at the lessons, take the test. Um, and this looked the same every time. We put the website, again, no www. And um, I also put their login information. So if I wasn't there, they would know how to log in <clears throat> um, in case they forgot. I teach, um, I teach eighth grade math. And the initial relationship that was established with uh, JFY Networks was, was really an MCAS prep class. And four different teachers taught it um, the first year. So it's really evolved. And, and it's, it's exciting to see what you can do with it. Um, we started last spring to, um, to try to fine tune what, how, we, how we get the, um, how we design our curriculum. So we started by getting JFY in, uh, facilitated and getting all of the math teachers together at our, in our building, so the seventh and eighth grade math teachers as well as the secondary math teachers. And we went through all of the results of the MCAS test as well as um, our own information about what topics, what standards were traditionally tested and we decided on a set of power standards. Once we established those power standards then that became the the baseline for the um, for the Galileo testing which was done the following, well that spring and that was actually done in the computer lab and monitored by math teachers and they could watch as the kids were actually testing um, their results so they could see as soon as unlike the MCAS testing that we have to wait months and months before we know the results um, they could see the results as soon as a, a student completed the question and this would just be a kind of a docu documentation or a, a screenshot that shows that. Um, following that um, we had established then um, where every kid stood. So was, was that student at risk? Was that student moderately at risk? Or, or were they on target? And my, I, have, I teach three courses, and one of my courses is, the, is a class that has your poorer math students. There are kids that don't have ed plans. They could be on a 504, but they're, they don't have um, a regular ed plan, but they're the ones that usually do poorly on the MCAS. So they were in my first period class, and I used the data from, from that particular test to differentiate instruction. So I only gave them work in the areas that they, they scored low on, and they used the computer and they used adaptive curriculum for that. Um, but now I have more tools, and that 
well, I'll get into, this is, um, this is Plato that I use for my math tech classes, and they, it's a set of standardized um, mastery tests and tutorials. So the kids can take the tutorial first and then take the test, or if they think um, they know the content, um, the first one is prime, prime numbers, and sometimes that one might seem less threatening, so they might just try the test first. If they score 80 or above, then they've mastered that particular standard, so they go on. So Plato Pathways um, gives you math topics from the standards, directly from the math uh, curriculum frameworks, and you can set them up in modules based on what your needs are. Um, there's a general one that has all of the standards in it, and I also teach a geometry class, a half-year geometry class. So I had Ryan um, take all of the geometry standards and put them together so that now they have a set of mastery tests that includes, and this is supposed to be an advanced geometry class, so it has um, the eighth grade level um, Plato, Plato mastery tests, but it also has um, two modules that are geared towards 10th grade, so the kids can rise to that once they've completed um, some, you know, the 8th grade module, they can go on. And that's, that's worked out really good. Um, I think because they're, they took all the advanced kids out of my regular, my regular Play-Doh classes and they put them in this geometry class and they, are, they miss out on the rest of the tests, which I think are valuable, but um, but they get to really do some advanced geometry um, during the classes that I take them to the lab. Um, another tool that I've used actually for all three classes is this, um, this Moodle website. And for my period one class, I use the adaptive curriculum. And for my geometry class, um, I use the Plato tests that are from Plato, but they have to do um, they have to do some journal entries that are included in this, um, this long list of mastery tests, and unfortunately we can't scroll down, but this, this is what, what all of my students see when they log on. They, they have a course to select, so they would be either in my math tech classes or my geometry class or my math connections class. So they can pick the journal entries that are assigned for that particular week and find their class and um, they had to make a construction that showed a reflex angle, um, an acute angle, an obtuse angle, and a right angle and they had to label their constructions and they did this on Geometer Sketchpad so though my version is an older one um, and, and this too is without they don't have instruction on how to use Geometer Sketchpad. So it is really cool the way that they problem solve and communicate with each other about, okay, how do I do this? Um, once, I, once I create my construction, how do I label it? How do I get it to measure the angle? How do I get it to actually save the document into, they can upload their document um, onto Moodle so that then I can view it and grade it. And all of those questions are or all of the, the procedures for doing that are generated from them and the answers or the ways of doing it are shared amongst them. So it's a very, um, there's 27 kids in that geometry class. It's every computer is taken. It's really cool the way that, you know, they are open to solving the problems and figuring it out. They spent one whole class period um, just figuring out how to save the document so that it could be viewed on, on Moodle. And we tried different, different applications, and I, I really had not a lot of background with using Geometer Sketchpad. It was kind of random that I said, I know it's on our, some of our machines. If you want to try it, then try it. And the results were, were really exciting. So now more and more kids are willing to, um, to take a chance and take a risk and learn how to, how to do that. So they have, you know, for me, they complete journal entries every week, which gets them thinking about their learning and being much more reflective. It's important to me that it's not just, they're not just going through these mastery tests or they're not just going through the adaptive curriculum or they're not just um, messing around with the, with the geometry sketch pad, but they're actually thinking about what it is that, that I'm trying, you know, what, what am I showing that I know about math? And so the, they actually can reflect on 
how they've come from being just able to identify a fraction to to show that they know, now have, know how to multiply fractions, how to change fractions to decimals to percents, and it ends up um, it ends up being interesting how um, how they they communicate better if you have them communicating on a regular basis. So by the end of the half year course, they will have number sense in geometry and measurement and um, patterns, relations, and functions, and we, we're just starting data and probability. So they'll be able to go through all of those mastery tests and then reflect more on what they actually gained from taking those tests. And I just see it as a very, um, a very, I'll go back to this one, a very motivating way to, um, to get through the same kind of content that maybe they would be doing in their math class. Um, but it's more interesting to them to be using a computer, number one, to be doing things at their own pace, number two. You're not rushing them to get through a certain number of tests. They're just, they're on their own, um, they're self-paced, yet they can communicate with, with others about the content. They can ask questions on, you know, I don't remember how to do this and I really didn't get it even after going through the tutorial. So, um, it's been a good, a good way of, of teaching and I can't imagine just being in a regular math class without the use of technology and I, I, um, I appreciate all the, every time I have an idea then I can bounce it off of Ryan and, and between the two of us, you know, we'll, he'll sometimes bring it to work and talk with all the rest of you about um, how, can we, how can we make this work the way that you know, this per particular person wants it to work. And um, we resolve those issues and, and, and just come up with more. I mean, I've always wanted to do, use the use Geometer Sketchpad and I knew we hadn't the money to, to upgrade what we have. So this is a way that, um, that we can incorporate it into, into what we have. I mean, we don't have money to buy new stuff. So we've got to use what we have and maybe the graphing calculators will be our next endeavor because we've all, we've talked about that for a while but um, it's it's a it's an exciting way for kids to learn and they're interested so it's been good it's been, it's worked for me anyway I have every other day in the I, I spend half the week in the lab but it's pretty much every other day that they're in the lab or they're in the classroom and we're either I mean, now they have, they have access via Moodle to their, their um, MCAS questions they, that they're expected to do. The MCAS questions and the journal entries they can do at home if they have the internet. Um, but when they're in the classroom, it's just a whole different, it's totally different. They're, they're not as interested and engaged, um, partly because they're trying to kind of complete some of the tasks that they didn't get done in the lab but I just see them as being much more in tune with, with what's in front of them when they're in front of a computer. So they're, they're focused on the lesson, but they're also helping each other at the same time. They're, they relish the fact that, oh, I finally got that one. That might have taken me 10 tries, but I did complete that mastery test, and I want to share that. I'm proud of that, and I want to share that with, with other kids, so I guess that's part of it. And and it's, um, I thought by, by making the journal entries and, uh, and the MCAS questions accessible by way of Moodle that a lot more kids would take advantage of it and it seems, um, it seems like it, takes, it will take some time for that to happen. They don't use it at home as much as I thought they might. I thought maybe they'd be more comfortable doing that sort of thing because it really it looks like email and everything the way that it's set up like a box. I like grading it better online on the Moodle site because I can give them feedback. I can leave it ungraded or no grade. I can give them some feedback or ask them a question in regards to their entry if they're just off target and they they are expected to check it and read my comment and then go back and revise it so they can they can do a lot more re-entries and it's not like it's in a book that they give me and I take home and I have to grade and then give it back to them which all some classes I don't see every class every single day so that could take three days perhaps before they got back to the original journal entry so this is quick but 
not as many kids, and it might just be it's different for them. They don't have any other classes that they do something like this. Most of them, there's a small percentage that does not. But just as other people have said that, you know, that offer some of these online things, there's, there's opportunities for them to get it in the library and, you know, get it from somebody else. But, um, but also, you know, it's always like the, the other day that we're not in the lab, I have computers in my classroom. So that's what I do. If they haven't finished certain things, then, you know, you and you and you need to go back and work on that while, you know, you people need to look at the smart board and do this problem. And you people over here still have an MCAS question to complete. Just tell you a little bit about myself. My name is Gene Benjoa Jr. Um, my cool thing about my last name is no one has my last name besides the people in my family. Besides that, only only people in my family have my last name. So if you do meet another Benjoa, they are related to me, <laughs> right? But um, and I I am a science teacher for the Lilla G. Frederick Pilot Middle School, and I've been teaching there. This is my year five teaching there, and. Um, I went to school, UMass Amherst, and I went to graduate school at Cambridge College. Um, very uh, Boston resident, lived there all my whole entire life. Really love Boston, Patriots. <laughs> and um, I was selected last year to help pilot um, the JFI J5 network portion, which is called JFI side with my seventh grade class. And on my presentation today, we will, I will be talking about Moodle and how I use it in the classroom to help assess with the students. Also, I will be talking about how the seventh grade um, science courses are um, aligned with uh, science courses and the standards are aligned with j 5 and different components in j 5 um, also, I'm going to talk about uh, adaptive curriculum, which is a portion that's in JFASA, which is very good. It's a very interactive piece that really connects the themes and also connects the themes and the units together. But it's not a memory-based type of program. It's more application of knowledge. All right, critical thinking. That's where we're trying to bring our kids versus just being kind of work. Um, also, I want to talk a little bit about. Um, the different parts of the website and how they how it applies to MCAS, and then also I will um, go on and talk a little bit about how I use it in application in my classroom. So, Moodle or the LAMS. The LAMS is acronyms for Learning Assessment Monitoring System. Basically, it's like Big Brother over the classroom. So there's a task tree that there's a task tree that's on the left hand side when you open up um, the LAMS when you open the LAMS. And um, it shows the, to the student, it shows them their task, where they should be. And um, I will assign them, all right, you're doing task number one, all right, today, and don't go ahead. What happens? Usually they do go ahead. So I go back, and what I could do through the lambs is actually physically is a little person icon. I can move them back into the lamp, move them back a lesson, or, oh, you kind of finished that early. You may want to take a look at that again. Before, we, before you can move ahead to the next lesson with the rest of us. Um, it, tracks, um, it tracks them moving back and forth, I said that. Um, also the greatest part, and um, one of the previous presenters spoke about it, is that I can give immediate feedback to the students. It's great. Most of the units start off with um, looking through a website and then they have to write, um, they have to answer a series of questions. What's really good is that that's immediately sent back to me, and then I could grade it and also send it back with suggestions, oh, maybe you want to talk about this in your next response, or you're not using complete sentences, or you may need to work on your punctuation. So not only just science-based um, science um, work that I'm working with them, but I'm also doing ELA work with them as well through the LAMS monitor. And they also can talk to me back, too, because there's a chat function. And depending <laughs> how well you report with your students is how well they're going to use the chat function. I used it a little bit, but I didn't really have like a specific structure for it. So you can turn it on and off. And um, again, I want to give a shout out to Ryan, because Ryan is really great when it comes to doing things that you need, like having the lambs adjusted some way, somehow, to kind of almost like customizing it for your classroom. Absolutely. 
All right, so I have to talk a little bit about, because my principal isn't here, so I'm going to talk a little bit about our school, the Little G. Frederick Pilot Middle School in Dorchester, Massachusetts. First of all, we are one of the, some, I think we're one of 30 schools in the country that all the kids in, there, in our school has uh, access to an iBook which is, um, and I wish I had mine, but it's doing other stuff. <laughs> but each student has uh, access to a laptop, and they travel with it with, they travel it through each class. And also the teachers, we all have websites um, with our curriculum, with our, with our syllabus, course syllabus. Sometimes we post our assignments, um, link important websites to it. So literally when the kids come into classroom, in the classroom, they can turn on their laptop, go out to their teacher's website, and either the jump start is on that, on that page or the homework from last night if they were late. So that's really good. Everyone has laptops in the building. And we have over 650 students. Um, 30 of them, 30% of them are special needs. Um, we have a third of an ESL population, which is another part of J5, so I will address that, but I'll address that a little bit later. 90% um, of our students have either free or reduced lunch. Um, also, we made AYP for the aggregate for math and English, and all the, subgroup, and all the subgroups, too, for um, that one, for, for Category 1. Also, we have, our school's about seven years old, going on eight, and um, the definition of a pilot school is that we have autonomy uh, over our over over our curriculum. Meaning, we still have to follow the standards, but um, we have the opportunity to work with different corporations and organizations on helping improve um, each of the subject areas we teach in our school. So that's what's making really good, and that's why we can work with JFSI. <laughs> so. We'll move on ahead. So in the first part that the first part of J5 I really liked was the adaptive curriculum. So it's basically a program that, that's within J5 or J5 network and it addressed either the theme addressed like a main theme or a particular um, a particular term or a particular concept in the unit. And what's really good with um, adaptive curriculum is that again it's not um, it's applying the knowledge that you've learned, or you're applying the knowledge that you learned, or using it as a, a to solve a problem. What's really good is that it really reinforces, it reinforces critical thinking because there was a program that we used um, with Adaptive where it was talking about limited factors, and then with limited factors um, in a population. So we had a population of eagles, and they had to change the factors of water and then change the factors of their food and by changing the, those factors you would see the population either gain or incre either gain or decrease but what that what that did was it just really put those terms like into into a more real world real world example versus just them just learning the definition and then giving it back to me either in a paper or back in a multiple choice um, answer Web resources. One of the best things about J5Side that I really liked was that the information was current. Um, a really a struggle for me when I'm planning a lesson is that the materials that I use, most of the material is dated. And with the material being dated, then you try to show it to a middle school student, they're going to look at that like, that looks like the 1880s or the 90s. Like, that doesn't look like now. I'm not doing this. This is boring. An example of that is, uh, and um, I would ask Joan if you could pass out student work, is that um, in uh, JFASA there is a unit, it's called Ecosystems and Biodiversity. So basically it's an ecology, a stripped down ecology unit, but the, one of the first tasks was to define what's an ecosystem. So they had a bunch, they had a bunch of at least three websites referring back to ecosystems, but they were current. They were current, they were lively, um, they, were, they were relevant. And then what, instead of just writing in what's an ecosystem, what are the different parts of an ecosystem, like the term biotic and abiotic, living and non-living factors, instead I have them make an ecosystem brochure. It was just a matter of reading it and then trying to find uh, their own connection. Which was really great was that if you look at some of the uh, student work, 
Um, some of the students, they just did a general ecosystem like the tropical forest. But some students took it a step further and owned it as in, oh, I'm from Puerto Rico. I know there's tropical rainforest in Puerto Rico. I'm going to use that. I'm going to talk about Puerto Rico, but then I'm going to use information that I found out about tropical rainforest and incorporate it in that. So then it made it even better. That person got an A, matter of fact. <laughs> so this just breaks down in j 5 or j 5 on the My Course unit and on j 5 Networks is how it's broken down. So you have our course summary. There's also a syllabus that's, that's typed up. And there's a supply list because there's wet and dry labs. You may need to buy supplies, you may not. But none of it's really extensive where you're going to break the bank. Um, there's a course guide, meaning that they have not only just e biosystem and eco diversity, but there's other units as well. But they're all listed down. So it's even great when you're first starting with the program and the kids are looking through, they log in like, oh, what? I can learn about chemistry. I can, well, I can, no, no, I can learn about cell biology. About Earth history, and then it makes them even more engaged. And um, I know this year when I'm using the program that I'm going to have them explore other, other, um, other, of other units on their own as almost like a free, like a free choice type of thing as a reward if they finish another assignment in class or we had a big project that we we're doing. So just to keep them more, and I know that they'll be engaged because when they see the information that's relevant, they will be hooked. And then. Then there's also registering students. So like um, you have to register your students after um, before you even start the program. So you got to put in their name and whatever um, password that they that they're going to use. We use um, for us um, they use their first and last name, and we just use their lunch number with the last four digits of their lunch number, and they log in automatically. All right, so they're great. <laughs> I love my kids. Um, the way I use the program in class is that um, I use it as a I, don't, I use it as a supplement with my other materials that the district gives me, that Boston gives me. But what I found last year is I kind of leaned more towards the J5 side stuff because the information was more current and relevant. Because I, I did not want to show them pictures of guys in flat tops and, and hammer pants and stuff. So. Um, what I do is I use it. I use it that in cooperation with my stuff from the district. Uh, I let the students work at their own pace. I'm not really pressing them just for the fact. I just press, I don't press them like you got to get this done today, all right? Because I don't use it every day. If anything, we use laptops every day, but we're not on JFI side every day. It's like twice, maybe three times a week. So if on the off days, if they haven't finished, I'm like, okay, you can. If you have a few already done with your other classwork. Be sure to hop on because I noticed that you didn't put in your entry for task number two. Um, combinations of wet and dry labs that, are, and j side does a really good job because the labs match with the adaptive, with whatever the, the is being talked about in adaptive, whatever is being talked in the task. For an example, um, with the limited factors, <sighs> with the limited factors adaptive curriculum, there was a dry lab that was called Frogs and the Flies. So we had Frogs and the Flies. Um, we did this outside, it was more fun, more space. But we had, um, these are flies. And then there was a designated pond in the field that was the pond. So in the pond, we had frogs that were healthy. And then the first limited factor, physical, frogs that were handicapped. So they had to hop on one foot. So then I spread all these frogs around the field. So then they, I gave them one minute to go grab a, grab a fly and come back, to the, come back to the pond. So some of them made it, some of them, of course, some of them, the handicapped ones with limited factor physical, they couldn't make it to the pond. So I said, oh, you got eaten, by ah, you're dead. So then as we were looking through the frogs, the frogs, if you look on the back, some of them had nothing written on them. That means these were the healthy ones. So if someone got a frog, if a frog got one of these flies that were healthy, they lived. But then some of them had limited factors, which were biotic and abiotic, going back to what we did with the brochures to go back what was talked about in the adaptive limited factors. So this limited factor, radiation, is radiation living or non-living? Was it? Non-living. So is this a biotic or abiotic factor? 
Abiotic, absolutely. So I'll be like, all right, and I'm about to make a story to make it funny. I'm like, okay, so you were standing in some toxic ways and you radiated, your DNA scrambled, you have cancer, you died, bye. And so they're out the pool. So this was really cool, but then again, it really drove home those terms. And then that's part of the, the wet and dry labs, all right. Um, a, lot of, uh, a lot of my assessments, I don't do formal assessing, I do project-based assessing. So in the project, whatever, terms or whatever concepts or themes that we talked about in class, um, the project should display that. So that's how I do usually do assessments. But I still know there's MCAS that they have to take, so I usually do for my before class work, all right, and I kind of want to talk about the other part of JFASI that addressed the MCAS, because I, I want that too. <laughs> but I usually do a before um, MCAS question. So the, it'll be straight from the DOE site with the multiple choice, but the only fact is that they have to select their choice and then write a one paragraph response why they picked that choice. And in their one paragraph response, they can explain why the others aren't their choice, the other three aren't their choices. So um, best practices, I think really um, providing a handout with instructions is really important, but I always start with the before classwork because no matter, I don't know what's, what's happening when they're coming from another classroom, but as long as they're a routine of their coming in, they're going to see an MCAS question as soon as they come in, sit down, pull out your notebook and start. It's the same thing every single day, even if we're going outside, keeping it consistent. The kids need structure. Especially middle school kids need structure very badly. Um, I usually do a little um, a jump start for the lesson. If, even if I'm doing a J5 side, even if I'm doing a J5 side, I'll do something like a word splash. I'll put the themes or some of the vocabulary from the unit and then kids will come up and actually just write what they think about this word means or how does it relate to them and then we go together as whole class and, and, elim and eliminate the things that do not incorporate with the main theme. Um, earphones are definitely important with adaptive because it's loud and it talks, all right, it talks. And when you have a whole class with 30 laptops out, it can get really crazy. But um, what another good thing about adaptive is that the te the audio goes along with the text for the most the, for the most part the audio go, audio goes along with the text so we have ESL learners in our school ESL students in our school so this is a great way for them to practice um, getting exposed to the language along with the text to help them out uh, and I always view the lesson I always view the whole entire unit before I really give it to them because um, I, I got to incorporate hands-on stuff as well. Even if there may not be a dry lab or a wet lab involved with it, I always want them to do something hands-on because the students really associate science class with doing stuff with their hands. I'm going to build something, I'm going to grow something, I'm going to feed something, I need to do something with my hands. So I usually always preview the lesson, see wherever I can incorporate some kind of hands-on activity. Before, like when I first started, it was literally like sifting through all this big kit in the, and we go to a training for like for two days and then that's it. They give us the kit and the curriculum and we got to just go off and running with it. Most of the time, most of the science teachers don't know how to do it, how to incorporate and make it fun. And most of the stuff is boring, to be honest. So most of it's boring. And I'm looking at the pictures and I'm just like, and I'm looking at like these, I'm thinking that it's the level as a student. I'm looking at these pictures, I'm like, this is like from the 80s and the 90s, 2000 something, like, I'm supposed to teach this stuff? Like, they're gonna look at this and they, they, I, would be ups I would be distracted looking at this. I'd just be cracking on the person, <laughs> the way they look and everything. So it was really, it was really tough. But when I did have j 5 side last year, it kind of gave a focus, one, and then two, it brought relevance to the classroom. It really related to the kids. Because then, like, I, can, I keep going back to ecosystem and biodiversity. It was, that unit was really, was really special. I would have kids come and they would talk about stuff like, oh, like, I was noticing that um, they took the dumpster out the back of our apartment building and now there's just old tons of rats, like, all over the parking lot. And I was like, oh, they were probably, and you're like, guess where do you think they were? They were in the dumpster, right? We just destroyed one of the, we destroyed their, their ecosystem, right? And I was like, 
Pretty much, yeah. So it was really good to hear stuff, stories like that come back. And then them actually, and I, even stuff went, homework went up, participation went up, everything went up. It was really great. In, at North Shore Tech, we don't have leveled classes, so I have high level students and then I have students that may need a little bit more help and all ranges in between. So it lets me um, not slow down the kids that are at the top, but not rush the kids that are at the bottom. So it helps everybody get what they need, I guess. I guess it would be the same thing for me. I, I always tried not to be the director or the person that was, and this gives me other things that the kids are working on. So they're not, it just makes things run smoother than if, if you're still not, um, I never, I could, I could start them off with something in math, but it wasn't like you can talk a whole lot, a lot about the content that they're working on. So, you know, you, you start them off and then you're free to go around and, and help each little group well with, with the option of using Moodle and using uh, Play-Doh, then you can have kids on the computer. They have a specific task. It is structured like you said before in your presentation. So it's not like there's a bunch of loose ends where that's the way I felt when I didn't have that, that there were too many loose ends and I, had, I didn't have a structure to bring kids into certain areas they now they have they are more focused and and it lets me to be it, it allows me to be um be able to move about better because i know that like they already have a, a task that they're working on as a teacher i feel more as a facilitator now uh, and I mean by a facilitator is that i may start i may i may jump start the lesson but it's really brief it's not 15 20 minutes of me talking it's more like five ten minutes of me talking in front and then pretty much um from there the students would run with it um i really like the opportunity of them um, having like an open forum where they can speak about about a specific theme or a specific um idea in the unit by themselves and then just me as the facilitator i can actually you know chime in with what i'm saying instead of like really forcing everybody to i'm listening to me i'm the teacher no it's more i'm the facilitator this is your learning um, this is you, you owning your grade. It gives the kids the opportunity for one student to help another student. So, I mean, don't they say that the best way to learn something is to teach it? Yeah. So, when you're in a classroom and they're listening and you're speaking, they're not teaching each other. And so this way, one kid can scoot over and help another student with something that they understand and the, the student doesn't. You should be able to help someone and they have to, I guess then we expect that they can demonstrate that they know it. but they've been exposed to it and hopefully when they have it again in their math class then they'll remember some of this but it, you know it's kind of mastery is is very subjective it's um so i don't know we did assess um, our students at the little g and um from the first and the from the first assessment to the second assessment they did go up and it was a significant gain i forget the gain um john I think it was what like like six seven percent or something like that. Yeah, but that's which is a lot when you're thinking in terms of MCAS and if you're if you're already in the hole because um again this district scores for science are low right across the board from elementary up to high school. So to see that much gain like within like a year of my students like I was really really excited really really excited. And then, and then again, it's just them owning their learning. All right, I, I just you gotta think about it yourself, like, or at least myself. Like, I'm not gonna sit there through a, through a, through a lecture of, through, about about something that does not relate to me, doesn't make any sense, or I can't find some part of it to connect. But um, using J5 side and with all the information in there, I mean, there's they always find a connection and, and then the student work shows the proof of that like some of the students actually took it and went to another level I didn't tell them to do that I did not tell them to do that and I specifically said an ecosystem but when somebody said oh I want to do about Puerto Rico and I was, uh, I was I was about to say no but then someone was like but there's a rainforest there and I was like oh, okay 
And feedback from the kids. I mean, they come to me and say, oh, you know, I, I, I remember I did this in Moodle and it was on the test. And so we are getting a lot of positive feedback when I ask them, you know, do you like it? Do you want to keep doing it? Should we do it next year? Oh, yeah, it's great. Definitely keep it. So there's a lot of positive feedback from the students. I don't know if it's more learning, but deeper learning. And, and more, more is, unfortunately, I think, you know, they, or some, some teachers get too much into that, like starting with algorithms before they really understand what a fraction is and, and, and that it's a part. I mean, they, they come in with a lot of, um, all it's place. all over the place. And it's like they've been fed this big bag of rules and once we get them, they've been so jumbled that they'll, they'll you know, I don't know whether, do I multiply, do I divide? They know it's one of them, but they just keep guessing instead of really just, just thinking about it. And when, whether it's, you know, whether you're going through the adaptive curriculum and you see it and you, they, it relates to real life. So the more that happens, then I think the deeper their understanding is. And then they'll get it better than, than the other way of, you know, learn this vocabulary word, read the definition 50 times and, and try to process it that way. Some students that were um, a little bit ahead um, keep in mind that the tests change. You don't get the same questions every time. So some students went through all the lessons and then they went back and did them a second time to prepare. Maybe they didn't go to every website under each standard so they could go back and view websites they didn't look at. Um, a lot of times my, my higher level kids will skip the websites and even the adaptive curriculum, even though they're fun, they'll skip those and just take the test and get 10 out of 10 on the test and say, okay, check, I got that one, I'll move on. So I encourage them to go back and sort of play with it, look at the websites and look at the adaptive curriculum. So they were able to sort of do it a couple of times. Now, the, the students that were in the middle or toward the bottom of the class, they may also do them a couple of times. They might take the quizzes more than once simply to get to the 10, or they might look at a website more than once because they didn't understand it the first time. So they might all go through the information a couple of times, but just for different reasons. I think, I don't, I don't, I think it almost makes it easier for me because I don't feel like I have to present something and, and hold their attention the whole time, keep them focused on me. I feel like I can ease up a little bit and let them, you know, if they need to talk to each other to explain something, they can do that. If they, you know, if, if they need to move around and not sit in assigned seats, I feel like the whole classroom atmosphere is a little less rigid because of, because it's just a different setting. They're in the computer lab, they're using the computers, they're at their own pace. I don't have to rush anybody. So it, it actually seems more fun for me to do it that way. And I feel like I reach the kids better more. You know, I can go to each student or group of students and check on them and see how they're doing. I can't really do that if I'm just giving notes or giving a lecture. If you were teaching one concept and there were a lot of kids that didn't understand, then you'd be really stretched to try to, you'd either have to you'd address the whole class and explain it to the whole class, though some of the class gets it, but if, if everybody's sort of working at a different pace, then um, we always have trouble with slope and y-intercept and Pythagorean theorem. It's not taught at the seventh grade, and they're tested on it in the eighth grade. So when the kids get to those tests, they're, they're stymied. They never have seen it before. So the, and especially because they, because they're, I mean, now they've taken the top kids out, so they're, they're, they're heterogeneously grouped, but it, it could be inclusion kids in the classroom or kids that were in special ed last year and we don't have special ed in the eighth grade. So, um, so then you can, you can go, to a, go and sit with a couple of kids that are taking that test. Everybody isn't taking it. If everybody happens to be taking it, it would be very, you'd need somebody that got it to help you facilitate. But since it tends to be that they hit that at different times, then, then it's, it's easier to get around to different groups. And, and if I see that there's 10 out of 20 kids that are just really struggling, I'll say, okay, stop what you're doing, you know, let me give you this information. Or we've found a couple of times where um, the reciprocal, if you put it over one, Plato will fail you. You have to simplify it and just the number will be the number without one as its denominator. So you want to, you know, heads up you guys, it, you're going to get that one wrong if you do that. You know, like I said, if everybody was having the same test at the exact same time, it would be chaotic. So you feel less pressured and more entitled to, um, you know, okay, I'll sit with this group when they understand 
at least some part of this, then I'll move away. So you just kind of a quick, you know, a, an explanation, you move on. And, and kids are accepting of that. They might say, you know, I've had my hand up for a while. I say, well, you know, mm -hmm. skip that one, go back to it. Um, or, you know, ask the kid next to you, you know, you just got to give me some time because there's a lot of people that are having trouble. But, but I also think the, the, um, the inclusion kids, the kids that, that ha have real, real, real issues that, you know, they need a multiplication chart. They need, you know, now they can't use a calculator unless they're, you know, solo. So you've got to give them strategies and they feel really good about that. They've, they're working with some old strategies, finding a common denominator where there's, you know, maybe cross products is just a lot more efficient. You know, don't think you have to do what they taught you in second grade now the numbers are bigger there's there's other strategies so it's more about establishing you know kind of a network <laughs> i taught you this strategy can you go and show that person you know cross products how do you do it and yeah so it, it it becomes a network of learners instead of just you know one person with all the knowledge you know dispensing it to everybody else continue continue giving us the option to edit inside of inside of the my um my courses because um, that that really helped. Because I know that I went in and edited it a couple of times. I don't know, Ryan, if you noticed, <laughs> but I went. <laughs> but um, I I yeah, I've gone in like, but the drastic, but like change wording so it's like more okay. This is right. Everyone can understand it at this point, right? Like a direction or something. All right, like that uh, option to be able to edit as um as a teacher is very I think it is really crucial. And I wish that if, um if you leave it open it would be greatly appreciated. For us right now our Moodle site is just multiple choice questions. But if I could throw some journal entries there we're trying to beef up their ability to do well on the open response questions. That's where they tend to have trouble. So if we could factor that in, I think that would be a huge bonus for the kids. We've never come together before. We yeah. though we've been doing this right. for a while. I, I knew about y'all. <laughs> well, I didn't I know about you guys. <laughs> <laughs> but the just hearing you, know, I saw you taking notes when when mm -hmm. um, when you were talking. So that in itself, you know, it's the it's the whole communication thing. So I can I can, you know, I'm always brainstorming with Ryan, but. But it would help like for all sort of we're all in this and and the more I mean, just from going to all these workshops and looking at, there's a lot of people that are interested in Moodle and, um, and wikis and, and forums, and, and they really do open up a lot of opportunities for kids. It's just, we don't always know how to, well, I certainly have to speak for myself, I don't know how to do them. So I throw it out to Ryan and usually he figures it out, a way to, to do it through Moodle and then, then it just builds on, you know, everything just becomes more and more a, a learning, um, a learning mm. tool, I guess. The people that have been working on uh, with J5 size so, and then anybody new should like come together so then we can highlight what we've done already and then even take even more, some more information from others and then we can help teach them how to use it. Because I know that in my school, um, now I'm co-facilitator for like the science department, so then now I'm pushing for parts of the science department, some of, some of the teachers' science department to actually get a hand and use J5 science and stuff like that.